Hello and welcome. So far in our sequence of videos on data pre-processing, we have talked about feature scaling, missing value treatment, and outlier treatment. Today, we're going to talk about multicollinearity. Just like the other issues with the data, multicollinearity is again a common problem with most of the data sets. And if we don't really know how to treat it, we may not be able to proceed with proper models. So in this video, we're going to cover all about multicollinearity, starting with what is multicollinearity, why to perform multicollinearity treatment, choosing appropriate multicollinearity treatment, common mistakes takes to be avoided and we're going to emphasize on this particularly because this is what you need to know for practical implementation. And finally, we'll perform a hands-on multicollinearity treatment in Python. Let's get started. So first of all, what is multicollinearity? When two or more independent variables in our data are strongly correlated, it is termed as multicollinearity. Let's refresh the concept of regression. So in case of a simple linear regression, we were trying to predict a target an outcome with the help of an independent variable. We were trying to fit a line which does a general representation of all these points. And we used to come up with an equation like this, which is representing y hat or the predicted value on the line with the help of this linear arrangement. So we have a slope and an intercept. Slope is the coefficient of the independent variable and intercept is the point where the line intersects the y-axis. But this line is not exactly passing through all these points. So there is a gap. For a given value of x on the x-axis, you can see the actual point is this red circle, but the point on the line is somewhere here. So all these gaps between the line and the corresponding points are called errors. As you can see here, the error is the difference between the actual value for the ith point, which is something that's represented by these circles, and the predicted value, which is on the line. That's called the error or residual. And the objective of a linear regression was to minimize these sum of squared errors. Errors could be positive or negative, depending on which side of the line the point lies. So we would be squaring these errors and trying to minimize. That's how we apply linear regression. And in case of multiple variables, the equation used to look like this. So for just one variable, it was just two coefficients, the intercept and the coefficient of the variable. But in case of multiple variables, each variable will have a coefficient and you'll finally also have an intercept. This much background is needed to be able to understand multicollinearity really well. So let's move ahead and understand when multicollinearity happens. Multicollinearity happens when you find a correlation between independent features itself. So imagine if we have two independent features, x1 and x2, and they themselves are correlated, then it's called multicollinearity. We want independent features to be able to explain the outcome or y variable. But if independent variables begin to explain each other, that's called multicollinearity. It could be between two or more pairs of independent variables. So you can imagine in this case, the equation is not explaining y hat, it's explaining x2 with the help of x1. And these are the coefficients, uh, beta naught prime and beta one prime. These are our coefficients. This is what we call as a multicollinearity problem. Now let's understand why to perform multicollinearity treatment and how does it really affect the outcomes. So we know this is a general linear representation of the independent variables against the target column, a multiple linear regression equation. Let's say we only choose two features and try to explain a y. So let's say we choose x1 and x2, and these are the actual coefficients, and this is the intercept. So y hat is equal to 10 plus 2 times x1 plus 5 times x2. But in addition, if x1 and x2 also have a linear relationship, you'll have another equation, which is something like this. Let's say x1 is equal to 2 times x2 plus 1. So we expected a linear relationship between y hat and x1, x2, but we also see a linear relationship between x1 and x2. Now using this value of x1 from this equation, if we put x1 is equal to 2x2 plus 1, in this equation, what are we going to get? So this is 10 plus two times, and we put this entire value here. And if we simplify it further, multiplying the values within the parentheses, we get 4x2 plus two plus 5x2. Again, adding the constants like 10 plus two and this 4x2 plus 5x2, we get something like this. So in this equation, if you see, we do not have x1. Can we say it can be written as zero times x1? So we can write 12 plus zero times x1 plus nine x2, something like this. This is another equation. This was the original equation. Is this equation wrong? Not really. Given the fact that x1 and x2 have a correlation and they are linearly associated, we derive this equation. Now the confusion is, is 10 the constant or 12 the constant? 
is the coefficient of x1 2 or it's 0? Is the coefficient of x2 5 or it is 9? That's where there is a confusion. And this confusion would further increase if we now try to put x2 here in terms of x1. Let's say we go back to the original state where we started and this time we write x2 is equal to x1 minus 1 divided by 2. You can do this arrangement. Take this to the left hand side and divide it by 2. So this is what it is. And now we're going to put x2 as x1 minus 1 by 2 in this equation. Now what will happen? Let's put this value. So 5 by 2 times x1 minus 1. 5 by 2 is nothing but 2.5. So we can simplify that like this. 10 plus 2x1 plus 2.5x1 minus 2.5. And if we simplify this further, we get 7.5 plus 4.5x1. 2x1 plus 2.5x1 is 4.5. 10 minus 2.5 is 7.5. Can we bring another 0 times x2 here? Yes, we can do that. And this is our new equation. So this is another equation. This was the original equation. Should the intercept be 10 or 7.5? Should the coefficient of x1 be 2 or 4.5? Should the coefficient of x2 be 5 or 0? So this is where there is confusion. Let's summarize. This is where we started. And we got two more equations like these. Now the point is that your model is really confused. The model doesn't know what are the right coefficients to rely on. And all of this is happening thanks to the correlation between x1 and x2. So if you see all the coefficients are varying now, the intercept here is varying between 7.5 to 12. The coefficient of x1 is varying between 0 to 4.5. And the coefficient of x2 is varying between 0 to 9. So the coefficients no longer are reliable. And as a result of this, we are not able to finalize the right equation. Again, why? Because we have multicollinearity in this case. So to sum it up, Due to multicollinearity, the model coefficients begin to vary more. And as a result, the model becomes unstable. This is the reason we need to perform multicollinearity. Now, coming to multicollinearity treatment, there are certain popular choices. First is, if we have a correlated pair, we can drop one of the features. So let's say we have some data where there are limited pairs of correlations. If there are features found to be correlated, we can keep one feature and drop the other. That's one option. The second option is, VIF or variance inflation factor, which is what we're going to discuss at length in this video. It's a very powerful technique to deal with multicollinearity and it's more sophisticated than the first approach. So we continue to drop the features with high VIF value. We'll discuss this concept at length. Third would be we can transform the data using techniques like PCA, principal component analysis, and we've covered a great deal of PCA through a sequence of videos, the references of which are already available. The last one is that we can apply ridge or lasso regression. So all these techniques are valid and can be used depending on the appropriate scenario. We'll also discuss which is the most appropriate amongst these techniques. Now coming to the common mistakes to be avoided, let's understand what are the possible mistakes that might occur. Going through these four techniques, so the first approach talks about keeping one of the correlated features and dropping the other. This might be feasible if you have very limited features which are correlated, like seven, eight features. But if you have too many features which are correlated, it might not be a practical technique to work with. Coming to the third technique here, which is transform the data using PCA. Now that's a great technique. Unfortunately, PCA itself, principal component analysis itself, is a complex process and it's not understood by people practicing business. So you'll struggle to explain the outcomes of PCA to the business representation. That's one challenge. It's a great technique, very powerful, and does its job quite well, but it's complex and not so easy to understand. The last technique which we mentioned is applying ridge or lasso regression. Now, ridge and lasso are not intended to treat only multicollinearity. These are regularization techniques. And we have covered in-depth tutorial on ridge and lasso already, of which again, the reference is available. So ridge and lasso would help you reduce multicollinearity by accordingly deciding the coefficients of the correlated features, but it is not going to treat it completely. So now we are left with one choice, which is variance inflation factor. And that's what we're going to discuss next. What is variance inflation factor? To begin with, let's go back to our multiple linear regression equation, which we've already seen a couple of times. Now we know in order to evaluate a linear regression model, we use something called as R square or the coefficient of determination. This was used to assess how good the model is. And the interpretation of coefficient of determination is something like this. So let's say if we get an R square value of 90%, it means that 90% of the variability in Y hat or the predicted values of target is captured by the independent variables that we have used in the model. It means we have a good model. The higher the value, the better it is. And this value always ranges between 0 to 1. 1 means 100%. Just a small twist here. If instead of predicting the value of Y, we begin to predict the value of each independent feature, 
For example, we try to explain X1, which is an independent feature with the help of other independent features like X2, X3, and these are the coefficients here. Likewise, if we try to explain X2 with the help of other independent features from X1, X3 to Xn, this is another linear equation. And likewise, for X3, we can have a linear equation. We've not added the constants here because that's not important, just trying to explain the core idea. Now from regression, you know, for each of these equations, you can find out an R square value. So in VIF, we fit a linear regression model for every independent variable using all other independent variables as predictors. Now you can imagine for each of these linear equations, we can always find an R square value. Let's say the first equation has an R square value for the prediction of X1. The second equation has an R square value for the prediction of X2, so on and so forth. Once we get these R square values, we can easily get the VIF. What is the relationship between this R square and VIF? So it goes like this. VIF for a variable XI, it could be 1, 2, 3, up to N. For a given variable I in general, VIF is given by 1 over 1 minus this R square value of that ith feature. For X1, the VIF would be 1 over 1 minus R square for this equation. So let's understand this VIF a little better. How is it related to this R square? So if this is our VIF equation, as we saw on the previous slide, if R square goes up, then one minus R square would go down. And as a result, this entire expression, which is numerator divided by denominator, because the denominator is going down, this ratio is going to go up. So in general, we can say as the R square value increases, the VIF also increases because this R square increase, the denominator went down and the overall ratio went up. To give you an example, if R square value was 0.8, you can try putting 0.8 here. You'll get 1 minus 0.8, which is 0.2. And 0.2 would give you VIF of 5. 1 over 0.2 is 5. Likewise, if R square value was 0.9, which is a greater value compared to the previous value, you can see 1 minus 0.9 will give you 0.1. And 1 over 0.1 is going to give you VIF of 10. So as we increase the R square value, the VIF also increases. An extreme case could be that your R square value is 100% or 1. And if you do 1 over 1 minus 1, 1 minus 1 is going to be 0, then VIF tends to infinity. Now, an important point to note with respect to VIF is that VIF base feature elimination is always done recursively. That is one at a time until we reach a stage where no variable has VIF greater than a threshold. So generally, we will be eliminating features which have a VIF value greater than a threshold, but we don't eliminate them all at once. We do it recursively, one variable at a time. Why? Because when you drop features, the VIF computation would be revisited. And as a result, the VIF values vary. So now it's time for us to move on to the hands-on exercise, where I'll show you some of these techniques in action.